Dear Heavenly Father, we lift you up, we worship and praise your holy name. We thank you for allowing us to be in your presence again today. We thank you for leading us and guiding us this past week. Lord, we repent of our sins for at times seeking our own desires more than yours, loving ourselves and what we value more than you, God. We pray that you would break down our idols and allow us to love you with all our hearts, with all our souls, and with all our minds. Let your kingdom come and your presence be manifest in our worship today. As we gather in unity, visit us with the fullness of your presence and help us to increase our knowledge of you. May we always grow in the likeness of Jesus Christ. Lord, we pray that you would anoint Pastor Alex as he delivers the message today, that he would speak with the power of the Holy Spirit, and that your word would be planted deep inside our hearts and bear fruit. Lord, we pray that your word would minister us to today and that it would touch our hearts and transform us. Lord, lead us as a church to grow in your likeness as a godly family and community, and let our light shine here in Shinchon, in Seoul, and in Korea, leading the lost to Jesus Christ. Lord, we pray that Jesus Street Ministry would be a church filled with love and the power of the Holy Spirit, like the early churches in the book of Acts. We pray that we would witness the power of the gospel at work, that we would see healing and breakthroughs take place um, through the power of the name of Jesus. Bless us so that we may leave here today with uh, strengthened and rejuvenated in you with hearts of praise and thanksgiving. Allow us to glorify your name in each of our lives this week. In Jesus' name we pray, amen. Oh, yeah, that's, that's not the title, but that, thank you. That's a good suggestion. That, that's the name of the section in this Bible, um, but, but thank you, yeah, I, I didn't have a specific title, um, but I am going on with the, the series of uh, just, you know, a month-long series of four sermons for now uh, on the book of Acts, the first few chapters, and the whole theme is <clears throat> uh, the Holy Spirit, the Christian life, and the church. The Holy Spirit, the Christian life, and the church. And um, I had like eight points, you know, right, last week. And I, I know, you know, I, I, I hear enough of feedback. And, um, you know, I, I really didn't realize I was preaching for an hour and a half last week. And so today I only have uh, two points. And... Uh, but even with that, I don't know. <laughs> um, but I'm just, I'm just going off of uh, last week's, uh, I mean, it's the same theme. Um, so my main proposal is similar today. I have one main proposal and um, two main points under it. And uh, my main point, my main proposal uh, is... What we need in life is more of God himself. Okay? What we need more in life is, is God himself. And what I, what I mean by more of God, you know, that can be kind of abstract. And, and you know, it, it kind of has to be. Inevitably, it is. But uh, what I mean is uh, I'm talking about God's presence uh, in our lives and and also God's purpose uh, fulfilled in our lives, his presence and, and his purpose fulfilled in our lives. Because, you know, I feel like, you know, there, there's something about the way we have been created, the way that we live our lives. I would say that we're constantly in search of something. Well, we're, we're always searching for something, right? And, and it's not, it's not just the inquisitiveness of the human mind, you know. It's not just because, you know, we, you know, I mean, I, th I think that aspect also, it comes from God. You know, we were created to search for deeper answers, right? That's why we have, I mean, all the studies, right, uh, sciences and, and humanities. But I think, um, 
you know, a lot of times we search for that, you know, greater meaning in life. We search for that greater purpose and, and peace and joy, right? A sense of fulfillment, satisfaction. Um, and, and there's nothing wrong with that, with that desire itself. Um, but again, I believe we, we have to return to the source. We have to return to the, the design that we have been given, right? We have to return to the designer who has given us that nature. So, um, two main points under that. So what we need more in life, whatever you may be in life, wherever, wherever you may be in life, what we need more of is God's, God himself, his presence, and his purpose. Okay, Because that's what we have been created for. And let's go ahead and read the, the main text today. Uh, just, just one text. Okay, Acts chapter 1, verse 12 through 14. Okay, this is um, just continuing, continuing from last week's passage. Um, so after, quick yeah, recap, right? After... Jesus does his ministry for three years with the disciples. Uh, he is captured right? by the will of God. He is handed over. He's crucified to die for our sins. And, and, and he's gone, right, for three days, as we know, and, and he comes back. Right? He's resurrected by the Holy Spirit from the dead, and he reappears to the disciples okay, for 40 days. 40 days, he's just, right? It's not, I mean, I, you know, this is not my main point, but don't worry. <laughs> um, you know, I, I see the, the patience of God's heart, right? I mean, for all three years, he's been telling his disciples, right, what the kingdom of God is, is all about, what, what, what life is all about, what, what, what God is all about, and and, and he has told them about his, his um, death, his resurrection, um, even as an ascension he has, he has alluded to. Right? He's told them, I, I have to go back to the Father so I can send you the Holy Spirit. But, you know, the disciples with their thick skulls, you know, like, like us, right? Um, you know, they need 40 days right, for Jesus to, to, to bear with them in love, to, to teach them, right, to remind them, to reassure them. And at the end of those 40, 40 days, he, he's, he's gone, right? He just, he just checks out. And, and they get a little rebuke, right, from the angels. Why, why are you standing just, just looking on? Uh, Jesus is gone, but he will return in the same way that he has ascended. And now we have verse 12. Okay, then they, the disciples, the apostles, return to Jerusalem, okay, just like Jesus told them to. From the mount called Olivet, which is near Jerusalem, a Sabbath day's journey away. And when they had entered, they went up to the upper room where they were staying, Peter and John and James and Andrew, Philip and Thomas, Bartholomew and Matthew, James the son of Alphaeus, and Simon the Zealot, and Judas the son of James. All these, with one accord, were devoting themselves to prayer, according to uh, together with the women and Mary, the mother of Jesus and his brothers. This is the word of God. And obviously, you know, I shared my main proposal, but uh, today's message is, is about uh, prayer, okay? about uh, prayer. And, and I think a lot of times, you know, just a little intro about the topic of prayer you know, I know it's a topic that many of us, especially if you've grown up in the church, it's, it's, it's just that one thing, right? It's like, yeah, we, we always hear about you. We need to pray more, right? And uh, it's almost just, it just becomes like, a, yeah, I know, but, you know, right? I know. But I think a lot of times it's because we view prayer as, as just another work, another burden to be added right, to our already tiresome life. But I think, um, you know, I mean, it's a straightforward, right, message. But, 
Even though it's basic, I think, I think we need to be constantly reminded right, that the prayer is a, is a means of grace. Okay? It's a means of grace, not work or burden. Okay? It, it's not to make us feel bad about, oh, you know, I, I didn't pray today or I didn't pray enough this week. You know, just like not reading enough the Bible, right? something that we know, but something that we don't necessarily always do. And, and prayer is, is a means of grace because God in his love has graciously given us okay, the privilege of, of prayer okay, as a means to, to seek after him and to receive more of him, okay, his presence, okay, to see his purpose fulfilled in our lives in greater ways. Okay? So that's my point number one. Okay? And you know, we have the right, actually, I really want us to look at it that way. You know, point number one, if you're taking notes. Because of what Jesus has done for us, okay, we have the right, the mandate, to seek God and receive more of him. Okay? His presence and his purpose in our lives. Because what Jesus has done for us. Okay? Because what Jesus has done for us, we have the right to seek God and receive more of him. And, and I want us to just notice something interestingly. You know, I, I know um, we kind of skipped uh, last week's uh, passage. But let's, let's quickly uh, just, just read there. It's just going to take five seconds. Okay. So verse 6. Okay. Acts chapter 1, verse 6. So when they had come together, they asked him, Lord, will you at this time restore the kingdom of Israel? Remember that stupid question? He said to them, it is not for you to know times or seasons that the Father has fixed by his own authority, but you will receive power when the Holy Spirit has come upon you, and you will be my witnesses in Jerusalem and in all Judea and Samaria and to the end of the earth. And this is basically what Jesus says, okay? And, and, and he got, he's gone, okay? And now we, as we read in the verse 12 through 14, what do they do when they go back to Jerusalem, they begin to pray. Right? But you got to notice something. Jesus never actually told them specifically, you know, go back to Jerusalem and, and, and pray. Spend your time praying together. Right? But somehow the disciples knew that this was what they were supposed to do. Okay? And, and I think that just, you know, that teaches us so much because, you know, a lot of times when we are given a, a promise by God, I mean, if you're wondering about what, what are the promises of God, everything, okay, everything in the Bible that's been given to the believer, right, it, 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 those are the promises of God, okay, everything in the Bible. But I think a lot of times, you know, we have this mentality, uh, you know, once you have a, a, a guarantee, like we, we have this tendency to be, uh, to be lazy, right? I mean, I mean it's, not, it's, it's like that for me too, right? Uh, let, let's say, like, I mean, that's if you've taken class at school, right? Uh, if you know you're going to get an A or if you know you're going to pass a class, no matter what grade you get on the final, right? By the time you, the, the final is coming around, what, what do you do? You just, yeah, you know, like, I, I know I'm going to pass, right? I know, I know my grade. I know I'm going to get an A. So, you know, I'm not going to try, right? So that, that's just kind of our nature. But we see the disciples here, you know, they've been given the promise of God's. Right, directly from the lips of Jesus that the Holy Spirit will come and empower them, make them witnesses to the end of the earth. They get this epic, right? I mean, what, kind of, what a promise, right? You, you've ever been given a promise like that? You will receive power and you will be my witnesses to the ends of the earth. But when they get this promise, right, instead of becoming lax, right, uh, instead of becoming inactive or idle or passive, right, they actually find a way to actively, right, actively pursue and seek after that gift, even though the promise was given, okay? So, you know, as, as Christians, you know, it's, I think this is a, an important principle that just because we have the promises of God, it doesn't mean, right, that we can be just, okay, you know, it's going to happen anyway. I, I'm just going to, you know, live the way that I, I kind of want to, the way, the way, the way to wait for the promise, okay? The way to wait for the gift of God. 
is to, it's to actively pursue after it. Okay? It doesn't mean that we can be inactive, passive, or idle. It actually means the very opposite. Right? That's what we see here. So the promise doesn't mean, for the disciples, it didn't mean that they didn't, they didn't need to do anything now. They could just, just go home and, and relax. It actually meant they, they needed to pray, and, and they knew it, even without Jesus telling them, okay? So the promise is what motivates us to pray. The promise is what compels us to pray. Okay? We pray all the more because we've been given a promise. Okay? And, you know, I... Uh, but we also got to look at the way they pray. Okay? They, don't just, uh, right? they don't just go back to Jerusalem and say, okay, guys, you know, let, let's hold hands and you know, let's, let's ask for the Holy Spirit. And, and then after, you, know, you can go home and, and chill. Right? They, they didn't do that. Okay? Um, but look at verse uh, 14. All these with what? one accord. It really means a, a singular heart, okay, a singular heart. They were devoting themselves, you know, that word devotes, it means to continually and constantly give themselves to, okay. All these with one accord were devoting themselves to prayer together with the women and Mary, the mother of Jesus, and his brothers, okay. So what we see is the way they pray is they pray with Unity and perseverance. Okay, unity and perseverance, two things to remember. And, and as I was asking myself, you know, in comparison, right, with the way they prayed, you know, I, I wonder how much of, of these we have in, in our personal lives, in, in the church today. Do we have such unity and, and perseverance? You know, I would say the, if, you, if I had to define just one most striking characteristic right, of the early church, of the Acts church in the book of Acts, is, is this. Right? You're going to see throughout the book of Acts, again and again, what they're doing is they're giving themselves to prayer. Okay. So what, what really marked them as distinct, what set them apart is their constant unified effort okay, to pray together. Okay. Not just... Uh, Okay, everyone go home and, and, and make sure do your, do your five-minute devotion. Right? But they were giving themselves to prayer together. Okay? And, and it's not just, uh, just okay, let, let's, let's just have a, a, a good time. Right? It, it's, it's this intense, unified perseverance in prayer. Okay? Intense, unified perseverance in prayer. So, you know, we see it's, it's literally, literally what the church is doing all the time. Okay? And, and, you know, it's not just a, a, a pillar of the church. Okay? It is the pillar of the Acts church. Okay? The whole church is, is built around and upon this foundation of prayer. And, you know, I'm not just trying to, you know, make us feel bad because I'm, I'm you know, I, I'm guilty of this too a lot of times in my life. And, but I want to I ask the question, you know, in, in, in contrast, you know, the reality of most churches, you know, today, I, I would say, you know, this type of constant unified prayer, okay, this, this intense culture of prayer is, is, is missing, right? It's almost non-existent in many churches. You know, a lot of churches, and I know we still have a prayer meeting, you know, JSM has a prayer meeting. But, you know, I, I was just thinking about this too. You know, prayer just has kind of become... One of the things that we just, we just do, right? This is just what we're supposed to do as a church. But I, I think we, we kind of forget that the significance of what prayer really means, right? What prayer really is. That the power and the promise behind prayer. So, you know, I, I, was, I would say, even though we still have prayer meetings, uh, a lot of times it's not the soul and heart of the church anymore. It's not the heart and soul of the church. But, you know, um, for the Acts church, right, the, the first church community in Acts, you know, this, this commitment to prayer, this priority of prayer, this culture of intense, unified, persevering prayer, it, that was the one non-negotiable factor, okay? 
And I, I think that aspect, it just can't be overemphasized. Okay? And I know we know this as, as, as truth, okay? but we need to be reminded. Okay? That's why we have to have the Word of God okay? speak into our lives. So, you know, this, this, this unified, constant, intense, persevering prayer, it was the one thing okay? that was a source of their power. And, and nothing else was more important to them because it literally says that they were giving themselves constantly to prayer. Of course, it, it doesn't mean that, you know, they didn't eat or sleep or, you know, they were real people. But at the same time, they, they knew their priorities, okay, what they were supposed to be doing. Okay. So nothing else was more important to them because nothing else was more important. And, you know, I... I just want us to be, you know, encouraged by this because I, I know how it is, you know. When pastors tell you, you know, you got to, I'm sure a lot of your parents, you know, if they're Christians or pastors, right, bless them. But a lot of times, you know, we, we hear, you know, you got you to gotta, you gotta pray and fast and, you know, uh, you know, these things, right, it's uh, like when things don't, are not going well, you know, they, they say, like, it's because you're not praying, you're not, right? But again, you know, I, I don't want us to look at prayer as, as, as a burden or work. I mean, what a, what a joyful and glorious promise, right, that the disciples have been given here in the book of Acts, right? You, you guys remember, they were, I mean, everyone deserted Jesus. I mean, they, mo most of them, they, they, the Bible makes it clear that they thought Jesus was going to be their political messiah, right? He's going to come and, yeah, you know, we're just a bunch of uh, fishermen and nobodies, but okay, you know, we, I think we have the Son of God. He's going he's gonna to free us, set us free from the Roman occupation, right? the Roman reign, and we're, we're going we're gonna to have our right, national Israel right, restored. But this Jesus, right, he is captured, right? and, and he is tortured, beaten, right? mocked, and... and is put to death on the cross. And, and you got to understand how crushing that would have been on the disciples. Right? And a lot of times we, we give them a hard time, because, but, but I, I would be just like him. I just, just, I, just for three years, right, every day, and I'm, I'm depending on, on the Son of God. And, and all of a sudden, he's, right, he, he's gone. So that's why they desert every one of them. Right? They, 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 nobody, even the ones that would say, like Peter, who said, Lord, you know, even if everyone deserts you, I'm going to follow you right, to the end. I'm, I'm going to be there for you. Right? Was he there when Jesus was being crucified? Right? Peter was the one who denied Jesus three times first. Right? So they, you know, I'm just trying to explain uh, where, where the, you know, what their state of mind was. Okay. And now, after three days, you know, Jesus reappears to them. And just, just, just imagine right, the, the hope that is being restored and built up. Right? But, but then again, right, it's like Jesus just keeps it interesting. He doesn't just stay after it, at reappearing to them. He says, I, I'm going to give you something greater than my physical presence. Right? I'm going to give you the Holy Spirit so that I can be with you. Right? Not just, you know, when I'm awake in one body, right? The, the, pre, the, it's, the coming of the Holy Spirit means that, it, it doesn't mean that Jesus, there is Jesus' absence, right? It means that Jesus' presence is, is all over now, right? It's constant and universal. And now they're given this promise. And, and, and the question is, you know, do you really think that they were thinking about prayer, and they had this attitude of like, oh, I can't believe we got to wait <laughs> for the Holy Spirit. I can't believe we got to pray. You know, that, that wasn't their attitude. They're like, oh, my goodness. Okay, Jesus, you. Now, I think that's when, I think when, you know, things began to click in their minds. Because, you know, even after Jesus reappears to them for 40 days, you know, they were asking this stupid question about, are you going to restore our, you know, kingdom of Israel now, Right? But I think after Jesus ascended, I think that's when they began to understand. I think that's when the, the, there was a shift. 
Because now, right, they go back to Jerusalem and they begin to wait on the Holy Spirit. They begin to wait on God. So, you know, I, I want us to just be encouraged. Okay, this, this is a call for, you know, deeper prayer life, you know, both individually and corporately. But, you know, I don't think we should, you know, easily uh, excuse ourselves right, from this type of uh, prayer. You know, just by saying, you know, like, you know, you guys, you guys remember last week I said, you know, that, that was a, we, we, we just object, right? It's in our nature. We say, that was just for back then, right? They, they didn't have a lot of things to do. They didn't have, you know, Wi-Fi. They didn't have smartphones. They didn't have uh, Netflix. So it was, it was easy for them to do that. And, but I would say it's all relative. You know, they were real people with real needs. I mean, these people were, were parents. And, and Jewish people, they had more kids than average Koreans do, right? It's not like they were neglecting their families. Okay, they are, they're working, like a lot of them, I mean, we know from, from history, right, that a lot of these Christians, they were laborers, okay, day laborers. Okay? And they, they, they had to worry about, right, putting food on the table. But this intense, unified, persevering prayer, you know, it really continued, okay, throughout the book of Acts. And, you know, you might say, oh, you know, maybe it was just for a couple months, but actually... Throughout the early church, the early church history, okay, this type of praying culture, okay, it, it, it lasted, it continued and persisted. And, you know, so I was just thinking about the importance of prayer, you know, even though it, it's, it's something that we take for granted. But, you know, um, I realized that, you know, every time heaven was opened up okay with with this glory okay, you, you guys do you guys know that in the new testament we have glimpses of of heaven being opened up okay with this glory and and it happened two times right in, in the life of jesus you guys remember the first one okay yeah the first one is well, it's actually uh, when Jesus was baptized. Okay? You know, you can look at it when you go home. But, but Luke 3.21, okay? Luke chapter 3.21. So this is when Jesus is baptized by John the Baptist. Okay? John the Baptist was kind of a, a forerunner. Okay? Someone that, he was a herald. Okay? Just preaching the message of, of repentance. The kingdom of God is here. Right? And he was prophesying about the coming Messiah. Right? So he was a forerunner to Jesus. And and when, when John the Baptist uh, baptized Jesus, okay, heaven opened up, okay, and, 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 and you see, right, uh, the Father okay, speaking the words of affirmation right, to the Son. Yeah, you guys remember? This is my Son, right? This is my well-beloved Son in whom I am pleased. But Luke actually says that, right, chapter 3, verse 21, he actually says that heaven opened up as Jesus was praying, okay, as he was praying. And in Luke chapter 9, verse 29, Luke 9, 29, the second time heaven opened up, okay, it was the transfiguration, okay? And heaven opened up at this time, and you guys remember that the glory of Christ, the glimpse of it is, is, is revealed. Right? But the same thing again. It says, Jesus was transfigured as he was praying, as he was praying. And, and it's, it's very interesting. I, I don't know if it's just for me. The book of Acts was written by Luke, too. Okay? So obviously, Luke is, is, is seeing something, and it's, it's, it's a repeated pattern. Okay? He sees when heaven was opened up, when Jesus was baptized, he saw that Jesus was praying. Right? He makes that remark. And when Jesus is transfigured and his true glory is, is revealed for a second, he sees that Jesus was praying. And now Luke is writing the book of Acts. Okay, and, and what does he say? Okay, when the Holy Spirit is about to be poured out, right, what, what he writes by the inspiration of the Holy Spirit is that they were praying, giving themselves to constant, unified 
persevering prayer. So the church, you know, was praying intensely with a singular heart, with unity and perseverance. And, and, and the point is clear, right? What, what is God trying to say to us today? And, you know, um, I want to read you a quote from one of my favorite, uh, you know, preachers and evangelists, this old school guy. You know, he was known to be a, a, a man of prayer. Um, you know, like, they have personal testimonies about this guy. You know, a lot of times he would, for days, he would, he would lock himself away and, and intercede. You know, he would often pray, you know, six, seven hours uh, a day. And, and, you know, he wrote a famous book called Why Revival Tarries, you know, Why Revival Delays. And he was this authority figure uh, on, on the subject of prayer and, and revival. And, you know, he, he said this, the only reason we don't have revival in our lives and in the church is because we are content to live, live without one. Okay? The only reason that we don't have revival is because we are content to live without one. Okay? And, you know, I believe in the sovereignty of God. You know, revival is not something that we can create okay, through human means. But I understand what he's trying to say, right? On our part, it's not like, you know, God is withholding Right, his revival. Okay, and we see that in, in the history of the church. Every time there was a genuine, lasting revival, okay, there, 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 was, there were people right, were, were, were driven to the place of, of prayer, just intense commitment to prayer. So that's, that's what he's saying. Okay? It's because we're so content. We're okay. We're willing to just go on with life without revival, without more of God's. And, 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 you know, I just want us to um, just be reminded that, you know, the disciples, the apostles, you know, they prayed, okay? And, and it wasn't a burden because they knew that the promise, the coming promise, that this Holy Spirit that Jesus has been talking about, I mean, they must have been thinking, right? Okay. Jesus actually said that it's, it's better for him to depart physically for the Holy Spirit to come. And I, I, I bet that, that baffled their minds, and they were thinking about it, okay? So, they, they, so of course, right, they, they wanted to pray. It wasn't a burden, okay, but a, but a joy. And, you know, I, I want us to be um, reminded, too, you know, with the disciples and the apostles, Obviously, you know, it wasn't just for the, the apostles. It wasn't just for the book of Acts. Okay? You know, a lot of people say, oh, well, you know, this, this empowerment, this gifts of the Spirit, uh, this right divine enablement, it was, it was just for the Acts church. Okay? And, and now, you know, it's, it's, it's different. But show me one verse in the Bible where it says, you know, it, it was just for them and it stopped. Okay? It, it continues on. Right? Jesus actually said, said that uh, John chapter 14 Okay? You will do, for whoever believes in me, you will do these things that I am doing, okay? and you will do even greater things. Okay? It's talking about the book of Acts, and that promise was given for all believers. So, you know, I just want to encourage us that, you know, we are the recipients of the same promise. Okay? We are the recipients of the same promise, and... You know, I think a lot of times we have this kind of um, kind of defeated mentality, right? It's like, you know, maybe that's how you feel. You feel like, oh, you know, you, you've grown up in the church and you know the gospel, right? And you, you feel like, yeah, I'm Christian, I'm saved. But a lot of times, I know because I, I have my, my struggles too, my personal battles. I think a lot of times we, we just kind of have this defeated mentality of like, yeah, like, I'm, I'm, I'm saved, and, you know, when I read the Bible, you know, all these things, you know, it's, it's, it looks good, it sounds good, but, but when it comes to me, right, I, I'm not so sure, right, I'm not so sure. But we have to remember that, you know, Jesus' death, 
right, accomplished so much more than that, right? You know, it wasn't just our salvation that Jesus purchased by his blood. Okay? The Holy Spirit, the coming of the Holy Spirit is, is actually part of our inheritance okay, that Jesus purchased by his blood. So if you say, oh, you know, this type of Christianity is not really for me, you're actually saying that, you know, I, I kind of reject, no thank you, Jesus, to, to what you've purchased with your blood. I'm not interested in that. Okay? That's actually what we end up saying. So we have to realize and be encouraged, be challenged, but also encouraged by this promise. Okay? He didn't just save us to be saved barely, right? Like we feel like, we're, yeah, maybe I'm saved barely, but, right? but we're, we're constantly struggling. Right? We're constantly wallowing in our Christian life. But that's not what we, what we have in the Bible. That's not what Jesus purchased for us. So again, my main point is, point number one, is that because of what Jesus has done, what he has purchased for us by his blood, we have the right to claim and receive the Spirit. Okay? And, and, you know, not just, just the Spirit in the, in the sense that it was poured out on Acts, but personally in our, in our lives, there are greater measures, right? greater fullness of, of the Spirit right? that we can receive. And, and we actually have the right. We can claim the right. Okay, to receive the promise of the Spirit. So, you know, I, I just want, you know, I'm done with my first point, see? But I, I want to just, I want to encourage us. You know, I know we have uh, one prayer meeting a week. Uh, and I know in Korea, even that's a lot. Um, but, yeah, I want to encourage you, you know, um, to... Make that a priority in your life, okay? Because, you know, the disciples and the apostles, um, you know, they had stuff to do too, okay? And it's not like they were just giving their spare time, okay, to, to prayer. It was, they, they, everything else, okay, was scheduled around their time for prayer, and I think a lot of times we have the priority backwards, right? Yeah, we're going to do everything that we need to do. And then in our spare time, we're going to pray. And I'm not saying that, you know, just, 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 you know, be unfaithful, right, to your responsibilities. Right? That's, that's not, you know, what Christians did in, in the book of Acts either. Okay. But we need to have this mindset, okay, and give this intense priority to prayer in our lives. And, and the key to it, I believe, is we need to do it together. Okay? I think that's why they were praying together. Okay? They were giving themselves to prayer. And when the Holy Spirit came, we're going to cover next week, okay? chapter 2, verse 1. When the Holy Spirit came, right, it says they were gathered in one place together. Okay? Why do you think they were together? They were already praying together as usual. Okay? So I, I want us just practically, right? Um, let's, let's try to pray together. Okay, and point number two, because of what Jesus has done, okay, God's promise is what actually accomplishes the work in our lives, okay? Because of what Jesus has done, God's promise is what accomplish, accomplishes the work in our lives, okay? And, and, and by work, what I mean is, you know, um, whatever breakthrough that we need, okay, whatever answer that we are seeking, okay, that, that work, that task, right, that mountain that needs to be removed, however you want to put it, you know, it's actually done by the promise of God because of what Jesus has done. Okay? It's, it's not done by us. Okay? Our power or our striving, our efforts. Okay? So God's promise is what accomplishes the work in our lives, but at the same time, our part we have a little part two in that. Our part is, is simple obedience in what we can do. Okay? Not in what we can't do, obviously, right? Our part is simple obedience in what we can do. And I think that's, that's one thing about the heart of God. Okay? The, the compassion of his heart is, you know, I know a lot of times, you know, you may look in the Bible and say, oh, oh this is like, 
this is impossible, Lord. I can't, I can't live like this, you know? I, like, can I just stay a, a minimum Christian, you know, w- w- without living all this out? But the thing is, you know, God is not trying to, again, burden your life okay, with, with just all these standards and expectations and works. But, but he's actually inviting you, right, into a greater joy, a greater life, a more abundant life, okay, as we respond to his call. And the thing is, he, does, he never asks us to do something that we can't do, okay. If the Bible actually says do this, okay, it is because he's going to give us the enabling grace to do it, okay. He never says, okay, do this, but I know you can't, ha-ha, right. He always asks us to do what we can do. And, you know, I, I just want us to, um, I mean, we already read the verses, right? So, so after the promise of Jesus, wait for the Holy Spirit in Jerusalem. You're going to receive power and you're going to be my witnesses. So, you know, go back to Jerusalem and, and wait. And Jesus is gone. I think what they do is, is pretty interesting. Let's just read it again to refresh our minds. Okay, verse 12, then they returned to Jerusalem from the mount called Olivet, which is near Jerusalem, a Sabbath day's journey away. And when they had entered, you know, probably means entered the city or the house, they went up to the upper room okay, where they were staying. Peter, John, James, Andrew, Philip, Thomas, Bartholomew, and Matthew, and James, son of Alphaeus, Simon the Zealot, and Judas, son of James. All these with one accord were devoting themselves to prayer together with the women and Mary, the mother of Jesus, and his brothers. Now, I thought that was actually kind of interesting how this is, I mean, how, like, how this is being played out. Because, you know, you guys remember what the disciples loved to do during the ministry of Jesus? They loved to uh, talk and have discussion, right, and, and debates, right? It's, it's, it's just like me, you know, sometimes, right? Just, right, we just, I mean, we like, we like to talk. We like to have debates and discussions. I mean, that's kind of our postmodern culture too, right? I mean, everyone has a say. Everyone has some opinion, right? And, and the disciples, we, we see that actually. It's, it's kind of a sinful tendency. But, but something is different now, right? They are given this, this kind of a, okay, like epic, great promise, but interestingly, this time, there's no discussion. Okay? There's no debates. Okay? And it would have been perfectly expected of them to do that, right? Just given their record in the Gospels, right? Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John. But after this, this sudden departure of Jesus, instead of, right, having this discussion, right? Just this panicking, okay? Like, guys, like, what's going on? Like, what do you think? What's, what, what are we going to do, right? It's, it says they... It almost seems like, right, they go straight back to Jerusalem. They go straight into the house they were st- staying, and they start praying, right, right away. And, and for me, you know, I don't think this was an, an, just an automatic, easy choice. Because, you know, I was just putting myself in, in their shoes. And, you know, of course, they, they got this great promise, okay, from Jesus they're thinking about the Holy Spirit. But I actually believe, right, just humanly speaking, you know, imagine what must have been going through their minds, right, as they're making their way back to Jerusalem. Right? I mean, what are they going to tell the people, right? And, and I believe, uh, you know, during this time when they're going back, I think that their, their, their minds and their hearts were filled with a lot of things. Okay. I think there was some urgency. Okay, yeah, like, we, we have to pray. We got to wait on the Holy Spirit. There's some desperation, right? But I think it was also mixed with some doubt and, and fear, right? I mean, they already experienced uh, their Messiah, right, being, being captured and taken away, okay? And, and, and now they, they are, right? Yes, they're, they're going to take Jesus at his words, but this Jesus, after re- reappearing to them, right, they, they were so excited. And then he's gone again, okay? So I think there was some doubt and fear, too. But certainly there is also faith and expectation, right? And, and I think that's, that's what overcame, 
okay, their, their doubt and fear. Right? Because even though they were all these things, they were going through all these things is in their minds and hearts. But instead of saying that, okay, like, okay, like, we don't know what we're going to do. Okay, should we talk about it? They actually obey the words of Christ, right? And, and I think a lot of times the, ampli- amp- the application is, you know, I mean, it's like that in my life too, a lot of times, right? You know, I see something in the Word of God or I feel like, you know, okay, God is saying this. He's, he's telling me to do this. But, you know, when I'm not sure, right, when I have mixed feelings about it, Okay. When, when I have just counter arguments, right, to, to that, you know, I feel like, okay, God, like, yeah, but, you know, like, don't you see, like, do you understand my circumstances? Do you understand where I am? Right. Instead of just saying, okay, Lord, you know, I don't understand everything. I, I have some doubts. I have some fear. But I'm just going to take you, okay, at your words, and, and I'm going to do it. And I think sometimes... That simple obedience is, is something that, we, that needs to be actually restored in the church. You know, I, I think that's, if, you know, one of the differences, okay, between the, you know, contemporary Christian uh, culture, you know, church culture, and uh, the church, of the, the uh, culture of the Acts church, okay? I mean, even going back, I would say just 50, 100 years, uh, maybe you've seen it, right? in your parents' lives, their examples. And, you know, of course, I'm not saying that their, their example is perfect. But, but I think, you know, there's something so godly about the examples of our forefathers, you know, the people that have come, right, the people of faith that have come in our previous generations. You know, they, they had this mentality. Yes, they had their faults, but I think they had this mentality, okay, when we see something in the Word of God, Okay, when God tells them to do something, they just say, okay, okay, we're going to do that. But I think in our, you know, postmodern culture, it's like, okay, <laughs> you know, we always have this kind of, um, you know, just cynicism. We, we have this reaction against, okay, reaction against his commands. But we see in the life of the apostles and the disciples, even though they were just like us, okay, human, okay, going through a lot of mixed emotions and feelings, uh, what actually mattered was that they followed the words of Jesus, okay, and and that that's a kind of a a challenging point for all of us, right? Because I think we're we're so wired to to live uh, based on our feelings, right? Everything is about our our feeling. And that's not necessarily bad. I think, I think God is doing a, a deeper work. He's doing a new work, okay, in our generation too. Uh, because we have a capacity, right, to, to, uh, to be sensitive, to be, to be delicate. So that can be a strength. But I think sometimes, you know, feelings can be our idols too. Okay? Feeling, our own feelings can be our idol, right? You can, you can say, oh, you know, like, I don't feel like doing this today, so I'm not going to do it. Right? Even though God has already revealed in his words, right, that's what we're supposed to do. So I would say so many times, you know, we hesitate, delay, or excuse ourselves from simple obedience just based on our feelings. But, you know, um, the question is, how do we Overcome that, okay? How, how do we make ourselves uh, overcome our, our feelings, right? the, the, the idol of just living our lives based on our feelings? And, of course, I think there's no you know, quick fix. There's no easy answer. But in light of the gospel, um, I mean, that's why I think every time we come together at church, you know, every sermon, you know, everything that we do, you know, we have to go back to the gospel, right? We, we have to go back to the gospel. And, you know, what I, what I see in, in, in the church today, a lot of times, you know, you know people want to hear something, something new, something more sensational, right? A, a new revelation, okay? A new prophecy, right? 
But I think uh, if you look back on the history of the church and every time there was a genuine revival, every time there was an outpouring of the spirits, just like in the Acts church, there, there was a return to the simple gospel, okay? the simple gospel, nothing new under the sun. But the, the, what did Apostle Paul say? Okay. The gospel is the power of God's. Okay. The gospel itself is the power of God's. So in order for our hearts to find genuine motivation okay, for simple obedience, we need to go back to the gospel. Okay? We need to see that you know, God is simply worthy of being obeyed because of what he has already done for us. Okay? He's not saying, okay, you know, do these things. You got, you got to pray like this. Then I'll bless you. Then I might save you. He's not saying that. Okay? The promise, right, it was given from, I mean, from the beginning it was that way, from Genesis. Okay? God is saying, okay, I have already delivered you. Okay? I am already your God. You are my people. Okay? Now live in this way for me to bless you. Okay? He's already done the work. He's already done the saving. So we need to see the bankruptcy of all that we are okay, outside of Christ. And at the same time, we need to see the perfection of all that we are inside Jesus Christ because of what he has done for us. And, you know, I'll finish up soon with the last part of my second point. So we, we need to see that Jesus is is simply worthy of our simple trust and obedience because of what he has already done for us, for saving us by grace. But also we need to something, we need to see something in this text. Um, just going back, right? Because this is continuing from last week's passage. Um, go, let's go back to verse. Seven, okay? So Jesus, he said to them, It is not for you to know times or seasons that the Father has fixed by his own authority, but you will receive power. It says, But you will receive power when the Holy Spirit has come upon you, and you will be my witnesses in Jerusalem and in all Judea and Samaria to the ends of the earth. Okay. And what we have to see here is, you know, a lot of times... You know, we worry about the commands and, and, and obedience, right? It's like we have a natural reaction against authority. It's like we don't, we don't like to be told what to do, right? And, and a lot of times that affects our relationship with God too, okay? But the thing is, we have to realize that what was the command, okay, that Jesus gives? It was just... Okay, go to Jerusalem and, and wait. Okay, go to Jerusalem and wait. You know, did he say, like, now, like, go back and, 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 and do all these things, A, B, C, right, A through Z, all the, just carry out these things, right, just per perfectly and successfully. You know, be my great witnesses now, okay? That, that wasn't the commands, okay? He didn't give them actually a work to do. To qualify for the Spirit's coming. He's, she just said, just go and, and wait. Okay. And, I, and I don't know if you, if you see that, but that's the part, right? He didn't ask them to do something that they were incapable of doing. Okay. When God asks us to do something, it, it's, it's always within the reach right, of what we can do. Okay. So the disciples... Okay, I mean, Jesus, Jesus knew that the disciples were, you know, they weren't very good at, you know, following instructions as, as they've displayed in Jesus' ministry. They weren't very bright. They weren't very courageous. Right? So what, what does he say? Right? He doesn't give them, right, un, uh, unrealistic right, standards and expectations. He just says, Okay, I know this much you can do. Okay, just, just go back to Jerusalem. I know the house that you're staying. Okay? By the way, that house was probably 
uh, where Jesus spent his last hours with them um, in the last, at the Last Supper. Okay. So he's saying, go back to the place okay. um, and just wait. Okay. Just wait. So, you know, all I'm trying to say is the command that was given, okay, it was simply instruction for a greater promise and blessing. It wasn't just a burden, a work to do, but it was instruction for a greater promise, a greater blessing to come. Okay? And I think sometimes we, we forget that. Okay? We, we're so worried about, oh, yeah, I, I don't want to do this. I, I can't do this. But we're not really seeing right, the promise and the blessing right, behind it that is attached to it. And I'll, I'll just give you one example, you know. Um, you know, back in the Virginia where I'm from, kind of, we, we have this lottery called the Powerball. Okay, I don't know if you're familiar. I think it's not in just, just maybe it's an East Coast thing, but Powerball is, and, and, you know, it has one of the highest uh, uh, jackpot, right? And, uh, you know, I, I've seen over the years, you know, not that I, I ever bought, you know, the lottery, lottery um, because I don't, you know, believe in it. Right? As, as Christians, uh, okay, it's okay if you, if you sometimes, if you buy, you know. But I'm, I'm talking about, right, it's, you know, as Christian, it's, it's not something that, you know, I just leave it at that. But, you know, I remember, I, remember, I remember growing up and seeing, like, all these, like, jackpot winnings, like, sometimes a, a few hundred million dollars, you know. And I remember thinking, wow, that's like, I, I was just like imagining, you know, okay, like what if I won a hundred million dollars? And, you know, I, I was thinking about this, like if, let's say, you know, you, you win a hundred million dollars of lottery, right? And, and you're, you're holding the ticket, but, but you guys know, right? You, you, it's not like they just send you the money, right? So we just wire you the money right away. There, there are all these steps that you have to go through, actually quite complicated Right? You have to make all kinds of financial and legal arrangements. Right? You, you have to plan it out. Right? You have to ha probably hire people, right? lawyers and all these things. And there are a lot of steps. It actually takes time right? to be able to go and, and actually you know, receive your, your winnings. You, you, know, you have to make the trip and all that. And, and I think that's how it is with, with God's commands and promises. Okay, God is saying, you know, um, I, I'm just going to give you a, a little, little command, okay? and, and it's good for you. I, I'm trying to bless you, right? I, I'm trying to give you the promise okay, of my blessings. But there are these little steps that you have to go through. But, you know, imagine if I, if I won $100 million and I say, oh, you know, the process is so complicated. Many just 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 have my tickets. You know, I, I, I'll, I'll just, uh, I'll give it to you, you know, legally. Uh, that's complicated too, but anyways. Right? It doesn't make sense, right? It's not a hassle to go through all those arrangements, right, to receive your winnings. So, you know, I mean, that's a silly example, right? But I think, uh, I mean, even that, it, it doesn't compare, right, to, to what God has given us in Christ Jesus, and I'm not just talking about, you know, prosperity in life, right? But I'm, I'm talking about, as I said in the beginning, right? When we pursue after God, when we pursue, right, through the Holy Spirit, through the means of prayer, more of God, right, His presence and His purpose be, being fulfilled in our lives to be witnesses for Him, okay? You know, God is not trying to make our lives harder, right? He's saying... You know, I, I've given you this privilege, this promise of the spirits for, right, your heart's contents because that's what we have been created for, okay? We're simply going back to the design that we have been given. You know, so just in closing, you know, remember that God's commands are always attached, okay, to his promises of blessing that are incomparably greater okay, than, than the little commands, the little, little requirements, the little work, that we have to put in. So, you know, God's simple instruction 
for us today, just like it was for the apostles in the book of Acts, is, is for us to wait on him, right? but, but not passively, right? Not idly, okay? not inactively, not by retreating, okay? but to actively seek and pursue his promise okay? of, of himself, okay? his presence and his purpose in our lives. So, you know, I want to encourage you, whatever you're going through, um, you know, the work, right, the breakthrough that you need, right, the answer, as I said, you know, it, it's going to be accomplished by God. Okay? It's going to be accomplished by the promise. Okay? God is not saying, you know, do that impossible thing in your life. Okay? And I know we, we have all kinds of things. You know, maybe it is a provision that you need. Maybe it is, you know, some kind of unforgiveness. Maybe it is some kind of, you know, sin habit or addiction that you struggle with. But God is not asking you to do the impossible thing, right, that he knows you can't do, okay? He's saying, I'm going to ask you to, to do what you can do because this is a relationship, okay? I, and I, I, want to, I, I want you to draw near to me as I draw near to you, okay? And I think... Um, you know, I, I, this is my last point, but, you know, I think a lot of times, you know, we're so fixated on the, the object, right, of our asking, right, of our seeking. A lot of times we're, we're fixated on this, you know, this problem in my life and, and, and this need, this answer, this breakthrough that I, that I need. But, but God, you know, he's, I think he just wants us to have this attitude of heart, okay, where we say, God, okay, just like the disciples and the apostles had to wait. And do you notice that, did Jesus say, you know, wait this much time, you know, and, you know, in this way? He, he actually left it very, uh, right, very open-ended, right? They didn't know how much they had to wait, okay? Uh, they actually had to wait for 10 days, okay, because, you know, the Holy Spirit was poured out, 50 days after Jesus' resurrection. Yeah, that's why it's called the Pentecost. Penta means five. But the thing is, right, they, they were just waiting. Okay, they didn't know. Okay. It, it just happened to be 10 days. But, you know, I think as they were waiting for those 10 days, okay, as much as the Holy Spirit, you know, empower, empowered them, I think the true transformation was already happening in their hearts, right? Because, you know, as I said, instead of having debates and discussions, right, instead of being discouraged and disappointed, right, they, they chose, okay, this time, let's just take him at his words. We're going to go back to Jerusalem, okay, and we're going to pray. We're going to wait on him. And I think during those 10 days, I think that transformation of the heart was already happening, And I think that's, that's what relationship is all about. You know, I don't think the disciples were worried about, um, you know, being great witnesses for Jesus at this point. I mean, first they were just glad to see their Savior back. And now they've been given a promise. And I think they weren't just thinking about, okay, like, you know, we have to have the Holy Spirit and then we're going to do this and that, all these things. I think they were just going after, after God, okay? And, you know, we have to realize that it's not the blessing, it's not the answer, okay? It's, it's not the breakthrough itself that will satisfy us in the end, okay? What truly satisfies our hearts is actually the intimacy that we experience with God. I believe that these disciples, as they were waiting on God for, for more of God, right, himself, they were experiencing a, a, a greater intimacy, okay? They were actually, as they were, uh, as they were living out, as they were obeying the commands of Jesus to wait on him, okay, they actually understood what the commands were all about, okay? So, you know, I, I just want us to remember that, you know, God's commands for us 
are really just, just expressions of his heart. Okay? There, God's commands are expressions of his love and wisdom for us. Okay? Just like a father, right? I mean, you know, a, a good father, everything that he does, everything that he says to his children, right? he, he has their best interests at his heart. Right? And so my um, you know, encouragement is that as we seek to, you know, seek after God, right, to, to pray as a church, you know, we have to understand that uh, the, these commands, okay, uh, come with God's promises okay, of blessings, okay, his, his promises. And for us to respond to those commands, it's, it's just a way for us, okay, to express our love and gratitude back to him. We're not trying to earn anything, okay? And, and, and even these disciples, again, Jesus didn't say, you know, pray and fast for 10 days, okay? It wasn't a requirement. He just said, go in and wait. I'm going to send you the Holy Spirit, right? I give you my word. I give you my promise, right? What, was it a conditional statement? He just said, you know, go and, and wait, and you will receive power, and you will be my witnesses, so, you know, as we just uh, go into a time of prayer, I, let, let's pray that that God would just give us um, a, a deeper revelation of what Jesus has accomplished for us to be able to inherit his promises. You know, we, we take, you know, if, if you believe that you, you've been saved and you have the Holy Spirit living inside of you, I think something we got to think about is sometimes, you know, we take that for granted so much. You know, we, we, we say that we have been saved by grace and we have the Holy Spirit. But, but we take that for granted, and I think that's why. When you take something for granted, you know, you don't seek it af- actively. And the reason why we're not going after God, that we're not praying more, the reason why we're not asking for, for greater fullness and manifestation of the Holy Spirit's power in our lives is because we just, we just take it for granted, 